come to you this day, God, in a, a land, God, that's still free, that still enables us to get in a pulpit and preach with liberty the Word of God, and God, pray to our precious Lord Jesus Christ, and God, spread the gospel of, of the grace of Almighty God to men, women, boys, and girls, wherever they may be. Help us, God, in this hour, and God, I pray you give us the faith that we need to move forward. And God, thank you for what you do to us. God, you're truly good and great to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. Trying to follow our Savior in vain. Shaping our life by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the song that we sing. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Led in paths of light. Pressing more closely to Him who is leading. When we are tempted to turn from the way. Trusting the arm that is strong to defend. 
in your bed. You lost your partner, your little partner that you broke this morning. He's gotten to be a big boy, that fella. I remember when he was just a little bitty fella. All right. Let me see if I can sing. After preaching of the morning, I, I don't know how good my throat's going to be, but I'm going to give this a try. How long has it been since you talk with the Lord and told him your heart didn't split? How long since you prayed? How long why we're just going to go verse by verse and and make a few comments as we go we do have an outline and we do have a point to this and uh it's the thing about paul uh paul gets down to a certain place in all his epistles and he gets to a practical uh place that you can take at home and you can uh you know Chapter 11 was all about the prophecy in the future and uh, the type of the, the, the olive tree and all that stuff. And, and chapter number 10, uh, of course, was about salvation. And um, you had all these different uh, types of Abraham and Isaac and different things. But we get to chapter 12, and when you get past 1 and 2, the verses... Basically, the rest of the chapter shows you practically how to carry out verses 1 and 2 in chapter 12. Um, we're just going to read chapter uh, 12, verse 3 to, to uh, kick off the sermon. Uh, it says, For I say through the grace uh, given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, comma, According as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Heavenly Father, help us now as we learn to walk by faith and other things. 
And Lord, bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I call this sermon uh, the walk of faith and other things because that's what it is. Now, in verses 1 and 2, we learn about presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. And we learn about being transformed by the renewing of our mind and proving that uh, what is that perfect will of God. Um, Christians in this world, like everybody else on the planet, we have to deal with how to make a living, how to raise our family and our health and all that stuff. But unlike the world, we have to do things in our life that deal with God. On an everyday basis, other Christians uh, and the spiritual battle that we fight every day, those are things that the world doesn't have to do with. They don't care about what God thinks. They don't care about what other Christians think. They don't care. They don't have any spiritual battle. Uh, if you're saved and you're doing something for God, you have a spiritual battle. And you do have to care about what uh, God thinks and what other Christians uh, are, are, are looking at you and uh, following you and everything else. But um, just because we got uh, verses 1 and 2 that are kind of up here doesn't mean that everyday practical things our everyday life we can't apply the things we find in verse 1 and 2. The first thing I want to look at tonight is I want to look at the walk of faith. The walk of faith. Notice in verse number 3... It says, uh, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, this morning in Sunday school, we were setting the oil and the, the lamp of the candlestick. And that's a type of the Holy Spirit. And I taught you that once you get saved, you get all the Holy Spirit you're going to get at one dose. Uh, you're not going to get more Holy Spirit. But, now let's talk about faith. Faith is another thing. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we run low on faith. Even the best of us. And... And you know, it's amazing, no matter how many times God answers our prayer and sees us through some crisis or, or gets us out of a hole or uh, delivers us from temptation, something else comes along and all of a sudden it's, oh God help us, uh, we don't know what we're going to do. Well, after a while you ought to start to learn that God's going to take care of you. Now sometimes that e is easy to say. And you know, a Christian is like a schizophrenic, don't you? You got the flesh on one hand and saying, no, God's not going to take care of you. You're going to make it on your own. You're going to flunk this thing unless you get out there and do it do it my way. And then you got the God of the Holy Spirit saying, look, just trust the Lord. You trusted him before. He helped you out and he's going to take care of you now. And you have to decide who you're going to believe. And it's hard. And sometimes God needs to uh, get down the, the canister of faith and, and give you a dose or two. And sometimes... Uh, it's not what we think. But that brings me to my first point. This thing is about your thinking. This, this walk of faith has to do with your mind. Verse number 2, uh, it says, talks about the renewing of your mind. But look in verse number 3. It's, it says, uh, To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, here's God the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul and Brother Jeff Benton from the pulpit telling you what to think. <laughs> you say, well, you can't tell us what to think. Oh, yeah, just watch me. <laughs> you, you shouldn't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Look, um, Dr. Rockman said to us one day in class, in fact, he said this several times through the three years I was there. He said, sometimes a Christian has to take a step back as if he's not himself, and take a long, hard look at what's going on in his life from an objective point of view and not a subjective point of view. See, when we look at our life, it's, it's, uh, it's well, what I think and what I'm going through and what I feel and my family and me, me, my, my, my. And, and it does you some good to step back and say, okay, I wonder how God looks at all this. I wonder what other people think of this situation when they look at me on how I'm acting and what I'm saying. And, and that will do you a lot of good. Because what it will do, instead of putting you way up here in your mind, it will put you down here some way where you can think clearer. Because if, if uh, you ever... Um, I don't know if some of you remember this or not, but used to when you had an AM radio and uh, late at night, I used to deliver papers, you know, or ungodly hours of the morning. And um, on the AM radio, 
uh, you could go across the dial and you could pick up a local station listening to something. And then you could turn a corner and all of a sudden you can hear one of these big giant mega stations right across the Mexican border. And most of them were playing preaching. And, uh, and, and they would just wipe out the local station you were listening to, okay? And then you turn another corner and you hear the local station. It was the weirdest thing you ever seen. But a lot of times I wish the, the Mexican station had stayed there because some of the preaching I liked. <laughs> but that's the way it is with your mind. You get thinking so much about you and what you're doing and... And, and, and your problems and things, you can't think in faith. You, you kind of block everything else out. You knock out all the signals. And what you need to do is you need to tune that radio in your mind down where you're in the middle somewhere and God the Holy Spirit's up here and the flesh is way down there and you can have a balanced view and you can think more properly. So the walk of faith is a way of thinking. It's a walk of thinking. <laughs> There was a school teacher who gave three pupils a difficult problem. He said, you will find it very hard to solve, but there is a way. After repeated attempts of working this problem, uh, one of the students just, just gave up, said, I, I can't do this. I, I, I've not my brains out. I'm, I just can't do this. And uh, there's no way, he declared. And so the second pupil, he worked on it, and he did not succeed. Yet he smiled unconcerned, and, 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 and he turned the paper in, and he says, uh, I, I know that it can be solved uh, because I've seen it done. I just can't do it. Then the third student, he worked on it. Then long after everybody else given up, he worked on it some more. His head ached, his brain was in a whirl. Uh, he took a little break and went at, at it again, and he went over it and over it and over it. And he kept saying to himself, I know there's a way. I know there's a way. The master said it was, the teacher said there was a way to solve it. I know there's a way. And you know what? He finally solved it. Why? Because he has faith in what the master said. His thinking was right. The first guy just quit. The second guy says, well, I know there's an answer, but I just, I, you know, I just don't want to try. The third guy, he got down there and he, he applied himself. And that's what it takes with your faith. It's a walk of thinking. It's a walk of blowing. Look at 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Now, I want you to notice that this walk of faith is a walk of belonging. Look, we all belong to one another as Christians. Um, sometimes preachers, and we're real bad about this as preachers, uh, we get so focused on our church and our people, we don't know anybody else. And that, that's a problem. And, and i got to say... Um, I, I'm a little bit that way, but I, I, every now and then I make, I, 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 I make it a point to go out and meet somebody else and make some friends with somebody else. Uh, this little lawn fellow that we got coming mowing the lawn around here at the church that we hire. Now he's been a good brother. Uh, he don't go to our church, uh, but he loves the Lord. Uh, every time we get together, we have good fellowship. We pray for one another. Um, our churches prayed for him when he was sick. Uh, we prayed for his baby when it was being born. Uh, I know he prays for me. He tells me all the time he prays for me. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I've talked to some of my neighbors. I, I, I've known the next door lady, next door uh, lady across the street from me uh, for years. Her name is Mrs. Drake. And uh, it's funny because her maiden name is Drake. And we get kidding that she may be related, especially if she has money. And she just laughs and says, I'm sorry, I ain't got no money. I said, well, okay, we may not be related then. And we have a good laugh. Um, but uh, I used to talk to her husband all the time. He was bound to a wheelchair, yet he'd get out there and pick the dandelions out of his yard and in his wheelchair. He had one of these little grabber things. And he was good at it, man. He could, he could get that... I mean, he wouldn't pull grass or nothing. He'd just get that dang line, throw it in that bag on the back of his wheelchair. And, and I've tried to make friends. But the reason you can make friends with believers is we all belong to one another. And look, you may not like your fingernails. 
but they're there for a reason. You may not like your ugly uh, uh, eyebrows, but they're there for a reason. Uh, you may uh, not like, uh, uh, you know, your chin or, or maybe your elbow looks funny or, or, you know, but you need the stuff. And we need each other, no matter who we are. And we ought to feel like we belong. And, and look, when you need someone to lean on, we ought to be able to lean on one another. You Christian ought to be available for other Christians to lean on. And they ought to be able to lean on you. And that comes from being part of a family. And, and then, not only is it a walk of thinking and belonging... But it's a walk of gift ministering. You say, what, what do you mean gift ministering? Well, look at there in six and, uh, six and eight. Uh, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy. That's preaching. According to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. That means serving one another. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. That's taking the gifts that God gives you and giving them to others to help them. Look, a walk of faith is not a selfish endeavor. It, you're not having faith just so you can be a blessing to yourself. You walk by faith to be a blessing to other people. I was talking to Brother Lee yesterday on the phone. And I told him, and I've said this from the pulpit. God's given me certain talents. Um, I'm not like other men. Uh, now, you know, some people... Uh, they're great at one thing and another, and people follow them around to ooh and ah over what they can do. I'm probably not one of those people, but God has given me talents. My job as a Christian is to take those talents and use them for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said he came to minister and not be ministered unto. Whatever you can do for people, whatever God has given you, give it away. Uh, some people, you know, they preach. Some people... Teach some people. Some people give. Their whole life is give. Now, remember Brother Don? Brother Don was the most given man I've ever seen. He really was. Um, there was one time my little weed eater broke down at the house. And uh, I, uh, I determined it was a switch up in the handle. And I, and I said, Don, um, you know, a lot of these places that I used to trade with uh, have, have uh, gone out of business. I know you do with electronics. Do you know where I can get a little switch for my weed eater? Well, he said, well, I'll look into it. The next thing I know, he's pulling up in front of my house and he has a brand new weed eater in his hand. And he gave me the weed eater. Uh, you know, that's the way Don was. Um, if you needed something and he could help you with it, he'd do that. And he didn't mind. He loved doing it. He had this kind of giggle, this kind of laugh he had. Remember his laugh? That was a fellow who walked by faith. He walked by faith. For 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Secondly, there's the walk of love. Look at verse number 9. Look at verse number 9. The walk of love. Uh, let love be without dissimulation. That means don't, don't fake uh, love. Don't, don't fool around with love. Don't, don't put on a false love. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Look at verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. You know what love is for? Now, you, I just spoke of, of giving and ministering, but the first point in the walk of love is love is forgiving. Love is forgiving. It's forgiving and forgiving. You forgive somebody and then you give them stuff. Now, sometimes it's not stuff. Sometimes it's your patience. Sometimes it's your mercy. Sometimes, uh, and believe me, some Christians take a lot of patience. See, you ought to be patient with some. Uh, look, we're going to get people into the church eventually. Trust me on this. We're going to get people, new people. And some of them, they're going to have to have a lot of patience with them because they don't know the same things you know. 
They haven't walked with the Lord as long as you have walked with the Lord. And they're going to have to learn these things. And you're going to have to be patient and kind and sweet and forgiving when they stumble. We need to give. Love is a giving thing. Remember the Bible word for love is charity. Charity. Not only that, but love is for good. Love is for good. Notice it says, Abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good. You know what's wrong with America? The Beatles had a song, All You Need Is Love. Well, that was a very Christian sentiment. That's what this country needs, is some love. People don't love their families. They don't love their country. They don't love their cities. They don't love one another. You know who they love? They love themselves. They love them stinking old selves. That's not what love's all about. That's evil love. That's love that turns malignant. That's a cancer. We need love that's going to do good to people. Some of you parents, you know what I'm talking about. You got that precious little boy, that precious little girl. And you know what you think all the time? What's the best for them? Not, not what do they want or how can I get them to quit screaming or, or bugging me, but what's the best for them? If you're a proper parent, that's what you think. And we have, haven't had that in America for a long time. People aren't doing what's best for themselves or their families or their country. They're just doing what they want to do. We're to, you know what the word abhor means, which it means hate. You say hate? Yeah. You're allowed to hate some things. You're allowed to hate evil and sin. Did you know that? Love is to know who to help and hang around. That's sort of like the first one I gave you, you know. Verse number 10 says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. We should have a special bond around Open Door Baptist Church. We are truly a family. We should love one another like brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. I, I want you to know, and I'll, I'll tell you this several times before I die, I'm sure, that I love y'all. And I hope you love me. I, some of y'all will make it real clear that you do love me. And I appreciate it. And I know the rest of you do too. Sometimes you don't get a chance. But you know what? Even though we don't have time to, uh, you know, this is a busy world. This is the busiest I've ever seen people in, in my entire life. Uh, and that's a bad thing. Because we need fellowship. We need fellowship. We need a time to sit down over a meal or with a bunch of guitars around a campfire or just sitting in the backyard while the mosquitoes are eating us. Just talking and fellowshipping and, 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 you know, just being together. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to fellowship for eternity. In true love. And love is not lazy. The walk of love is not a lazy. Look at verse number 11. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, the trouble with most people is, is that um, they are busy people. I don't think there's a lazy person in this church. I really don't. Um, and you do what you can to serve the Lord. What happens with good people like you, I say the trouble, but I don't mean trouble. Uh, I mean, one of the things that goes on is y'all don't blow your trumpets. And see, a lot of churches, people go, uh, love me! I put a big check in the offering, ah, you know, or, or I'm the choir director, or, you know, I'm the head of the bass section in the choir, or, or, or something. Look, God's not interested in that. God wants you to go, keep busy for Him, keep your nose to the grindstone, and out of love, do what you love. Your love for Him, your love for others. And if you have true love in your heart, you're not going to be a lazy person. You're going to get there, and you're going to serve the Lord. And you're going to uh, be fervent in spirit. Now, sometimes as pastor, I get a little concerned. 
But we live in a we live in a world that tries to wear us out. The devil tries to wear us out. Sometimes people come to church and they're tired, and and they don't you know they don't necessarily want to sing for five and a half hours or two and a half hours or even one and a half songs. They they they'd like to they'd like to hear some preaching and go home and rest. And we have to love one another enough to to know that that's not a problem. Uh, in love, we try to help one another. Love stems from a close walk with God. You know, if you love God, you're going to love others. Notice what it says in verse 12. Hoping, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Look, you ought to walk close to God every day, uh, every moment of the day. You ought to be in spiritual shape to look up and say, God, I need you. God, uh, about this thing I'm doing right now, I need your help. I do that all the time. And you know what? I feel like God listens to me. Love is not nasty or hateful even to the enemies that we have. Look at verse 14. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That's the walk of love, folks. Look. I know sometimes you'd rather punch somebody in the nose and reason with them. But you've got to reason with them. Sometimes uh, you, you don't want to be nice to somebody. You're impatient. You're angry. You're tired. You're, but, but you've got to let that love into your life. And, and see, if you make a practice of walking in love, when that time when you're tired and don't feel like it comes along, you've walked along enough in love where it's going to kind of take over for you and help you a little bit down the road. Now love, finally, this walk of love, the last two things. The walk of faith, the walk of love. Love is mindful of the state of others. Look at verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. And weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You understand that love is mindful of the state of others. Their emotional state. If you see someone that's about to cry or is having a real hard time, depressed, or, or you know, just, uh, you don't go and beat them over the head and, and drive them down further. You try to lift them up. Uh, love is conscious of their mental state. You know, some people get confused. Um, sometimes our elders will, will have, uh, uh, you know, mental instabilities as they get older. And we have to... The Bible says, comfort the feeble-minded. Um, love them. Help them. Um, and of course, in this country, we do have people with a social estate problem. Their, their, their social estate isn't high as what they'd like. Or they're homeless. or uh, they have pro And look, we have to deal with those people out of love. We do. Um, and love is honest and peaceful. Love is honest and peaceful. Verses 1 through 8 in that chapter, if you read that thing, you will understand that love is honest and peaceful. Look at verse 18, if it be possible. As much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. You know, that's not easy to do. Sometimes your neighbors and people that you know get on your nerves. But love, walking in love, you're going to have to get along with them and find a peaceful way to be honest with them and be peaceful with them. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling Savior. Finally, not only do we have the walk of faith, the walk of love, but we have the way in this chapter. Now listen. We have the way in this chapter to deal with difficult people. You know what I find uh, harder to do than anything is dealing with someone that's difficult. <laughs> Everybody meets difficult people. They give you a hard time just to give you a hard time. They're, uh, they're nasty just to be nasty. Or, or they're just uh, officious just to be officious. Have you ever get on, on the telephone with one of these... Uh, uh, you know, people, you know, the, one of these tech helplines or something, and you talk to some of these dudes, 
Some of them, you know, they don't care a world and anything in the world about you and your problem. They're just trying to get you off the phone so they can get to the next one. And it's real easy to get kind of irked at this kind of person. Because you need some help with your computer or phone or whatever it is. Uh, it, and the Bible shows us how to deal with difficult people. Sometimes you're mad at a person because they've done something legitimately wrong. And they've hurt you, your family, your business, or your church. But the Bible provides us a way to deal with difficult people. Some people actually injured you. Emotionally, physically, socially. And we have to follow what the Bible says. Look at verse number 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. But rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now you need to take the Lord up on this verse and depend on him to take your part. This is a promise to you, Christian. You, uh, now, I know we tell stories about Billy Sunday, you know, some guy slapped him in the cheek and then he turned the other cheek and he said, well, I'm out of cheeks and he threw his coat off and put up his deuce. You know, we tell stories like that and we all kind of laugh. But really, truly, a Christian needs to depend on God to take care of his part. Um, we really do need to let God do it. Uh, let me tell you something. You're only a human being. You can only go so far legally to get back at someone and still be in law. You go too far and they'll arrest you and put you in jail. But you know what? God Almighty, no one's going to question what He does. And only He knows the motive of the other person's heart. All you can do is look on the outside. I've seen God do things to people I couldn't believe. And then other times, I thought God was really going to clean their clock and God didn't do anything to them hardly at all. And God had to remind me that He's God and He knows what's going on in here and I don't. So I better just leave it to Him. And notice He promised that He would repay your injury. I've seen Him do it many times. Uh, I've actually seen God kill a person. Uh, some people were very awful to Brother Bill when we were at Florida Town. They uh, got him in the middle of a room of um, people that were supposed to be his elders in the Southern Baptist Convention and they grilled him for two hours and tried to uh, I mean they said things to that fellow that nobody ought to have said to them and the guy that was heading it all that was uh, spearheading it um, two years later he was deader than a mackerel and I prayed about that thing and God you know what God told me he said uh, look you prayed that I'd take care of this man, and I took care of him. Is it good enough for you? I said, yes, Lord, have mercy on me. Depend on the Lord to take your part. Doing good makes them feel bad. <laughs> you really want to make them feel bad? Well, let's look what the Bible says. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That's the best way to make someone that hates God and hates you feel real bad. Bake them a pie. Give, make them some lasagna. Fix their car. Uh, uh, mow their grass for nothing. Just, just, just cuz. It'll make them feel, it'll drive them absolutely crazy. Because they hate your guts. And you know they hate your guts. And you're nice to them anyway. And, they, and they, they'll they sit there and go, why, why, why? And God the Holy Spirit will slip in there and say, because he's a Christian and he's I've, he, I live inside of him and you have no business hating him because he's my child or she's my child. There was a lady at Linda's work years ago that used to drive her nuts. She hated Linda. She hated Christians. And, and I would... Linda would come home and say, I'm, I'm ready to break this woman in half. And I said, sweetie, tomorrow I'll go take her something. Be sweet. Go buy her some lunch. And, well, I don't think you ever took her to lunch, but you, you 
finally screwed up enough Christian goodness in your heart to go do something nice for her. <laughs> and it would drive her crazy. Just a little something. Good for evil. Now, I don't know if I've told you this, but President William McKinley was a Christian, a Methodist, say Methodist Christian. He used to pray every day. When he won the election for the second time, they came to tell him that he won the election, and they, they came, he came to his door, and no one answered the door, and finally they knocked and knocked, and, and somebody got up and opened the door, and there was Mr. McKinley on his knees with his family, praising God that he had won the election. But when uh, he was running for that election during the congressional campaigns, he was followed from place to place by a reporter from a paper of the opposite political opinion than he had. And this guy uh, was one of those uh, people that was described as shrewd, persistent fellows who always was at work, quick to see an opportunity, and skilled at making the most of it. In other words, he's a pest. He couldn't get rid of him. Everywhere he went, there's this little fellow was. And uh, while Mr. McKinley was annoyed by the misrepresentations to which this fellow almost daily subjected him in his paper, he couldn't help admiring the skill and persistence at which he was assailed every day by this little gentleman. And uh, his admiration, too, was not unmixed with compassion. For the reporter was a, a little man. He was ill most of the time. He was poorly clad. He had an annoying cough. And one night, Mr. McKinley took off in a carriage to go to a nearby town at which he was billed to speak. And the weather was cold and raw and raining. And uh, this little reporter guy had bribed the driver of the carriage to let him ride on top of the carriage with the presidential candidate inside. And uh, Mr. McKinley, of course, knew he was up there because he heard his cough the whole time. And so finally, about halfway to the town, he banged on the top of the carriage and said, Stop the carriage. And he got out of the carriage and he went over to the side in which the reporter, and he said, Get down from that seat, young man. And the young man said, Uh-oh. <laughs> and he got down as ordered and obeyed. He thought, well, now's the time for the politician's revenge. It's, it's finally come. He's going to leave me on the side of the road in the rain. And I deserve it. I've been a pest. But that's not what Mr. McKinley did. Mr. McKinley took his great big overcoat. And he said, hold out your arms. And he put the overcoat on the young man. He said, does that feel better? I said, yeah. He said, now get in the carriage and sit next to me. We're going to town. And he looked up at Mr. McKinley. And he said, I, I guess you don't know who I am, do you? I'm the one that's been with you through the whole campaign and, and given it to you every time I have the chance and rip you to pieces if I could. In fact, I'm here to do that tonight. Mr. McKinley looked at him with kind eyes. He said, I know, son. But you put on this coat and get warm inside and get feeling better. So you can do a good job. Now that's Christianity, folks. That's Christianity. That fellow felt... He, he wrote later that he felt about that tall. Riding the whole way to town. Guess who became a great supporter of President William McKinley? That guy. That guy. You defeat evil with good. Look at verse 21. The last verse in the chapter. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. See, we need to walk by faith. We need to walk with love. And we need to find a way to deal with those difficult people in our life that's not going to ruin our reputation or put a smudge on God's honor. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Those are some hard things to do, folks. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Hard words to live by. 
two little boys were talking, and uh, one little kid said to the other one, said, wouldn't you hate to wear glasses all the time? And the other little boy said, no, not if they were like some of my grandma's glasses. She always seems to see people that are tired and sad and knows just what to do to make them feel better. One day, I asked her how she could see uh, that way all the time. She told me that it was the way she had learned to look at things when she grew older. Then he thought for a minute and says, You know, I think you're right. I think it must be her glasses. No, it wasn't her glasses. Put that in here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the plan in this chapter, and I've just given you the rest of the plan. Our walk means a great deal. It takes a lot of prayer, it takes a lot of planning, and it takes a lot of purpose and will to carry it out in your life. I hope what I've said did not help you. Um, Paul meant it to help you. You said, well, some of the things you said aren't exactly easy. Well, I never said they were easy. I just said it's what we ought to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your book. Thank you, Lord God, that we can take your book. And God, we can look at it, just what it says. And we don't have to be fancy about it or go through a lot of vocabulary or higher learning to understand what it says. But God, I pray you just uh, help us, everyone, to look at these things and see how we can apply them in our life. And God, help us to overcome evil with good. There's evil abroad in the land. And God, evil abroad in our town. And God, keep us safe from it. Help us when it comes around to pour a lot of good on it. Lord, please, help us. Come back and get us. God, tonight would be good. But if you leave us here, help us to walk by faith and walk by these other things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.